Sean Miller and the Xavier Musketeers got some tough news with big man Zach Fremantle out at least for the first half of the upcoming season and potentially the entire year. Wow. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, folks, welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national co- podcast, part, of course, of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Andy Patton. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Folks, we are continuing our conference preview series today. We will discuss the Big West, which features one of the best mid-major scorers in the entire country, as well as a team that is quietly building themselves into a mid-major powerhouse. We'll get to all of that, but first, leading off the show with some big news out of the Big East Conference, Zach Fremantle, starting center for Sean Miller and Xavier, is going to be out at least until January and may miss the entire 2023-24 college basketball season. This was reported by Jeff Goodman of Stadium on Twitter on September 9th. Fremantle already dealt with injuries last year. He missed 15 games down the stretch, only played 22 games last year. There was kind of hope that he would return potentially in time for the NCAA tournament for Sean Miller's squad. That did not end up happening. Miller and the Xavier team still made a really nice run in the NCAA tournament. They were a three seed that uh, ended up making it into the Sweet 16 before falling to Texas. But unfortunately for Fremantle, the offseason surgery he had on that foot hasn't really helped. He hasn't been progressing. And it sounds like there is a a rumor that he may end up having to have surgery again, which is what's leading to the delayed timeline for him to return from injury. Hopefully it is not the entire season for Fremantle. He's entering his fourth and final, excuse me, his fifth and final season of eligibility for Xavier. He has been a musketeer for his entire college basketball career. And he was a really big part of Xavier's success last season, again, despite missing the second half of the year. When he was on the floor, he averaged 15.2 points, eight rebounds, about three assists, played about 29 minutes per game. He was a uh, he's a career 35% three-point shooter. So a six foot eleven guy who can space the floor, stretch out like that. That's something that Sean Miller really loves in his offense. That's something that really helps uh, the kind of the engine go for Xavier. And a guy who shot a, a stunning 63.6% from three last year. It was a sample size of 22 shots. But folks, I'll be honest with you, when I saw the 63% next to his name, I thought the sample size was going to be even smaller than that. Not that 22 threes is a significantly large sample size by any stretch of the imagination, but this dude was shooting the absolute lights out during his season last year. And to lose him, lose his size, lose his rebounding, lose his rim protection, this could be a really devastating blow for Sean Miller. And we're going to get into the team a little bit, but before we get into that, this is just a tough blow for Zach, a young man who has had a really prolific career at Xavier's a thousand point scorer for the Musketeers. He was big East all freshman back in his freshman year. He was the most improved player in the conference in that 2020, 21 season. He was also an all big, all big East contributor that year as well. He averaged like 16 and nine that season. It was far and away the most prolific year of his career, Uh, but he's been a fantastic player for Sean Miller for many, or for Xavier, I should say for many years and a guy that, will go down as one of the better four or five-year players in the school's history. But unfortunately, injuries will be a part of his written story, and now it's going to be have a huge impact. If he does return at any point next season, it will be his final year. If he misses the entire year, he could, in theory, return for what would be a sixth year in college if he wanted to. I don't know if that's something that is on his radar, if he's planning to do that, depending on the situation. Of course, this is all pretty brand new at this point, but... This has been a pretty tough offseason for Sean Lauren. They've made some great additions, and we'll get to that. But this is a team that already lost Jack Nungy to graduation. He, he's out the door. He was their other big man. I think I said earlier that Fremantle is 6'11". He's actually 6'9". Nungy is the one who's 6'11". But regardless, a uh, big man who could stretch the floor. But now Xavier's out. Nungy's gone. Sule Boom graduated after a prolific college basketball career. Colby Jones is in the NBA. He fell to the second round, but still out the door for Miller's squad. Adam Kunkel is gone as well. That's that's your four of your five leading scorers right there for this team. The other ones are Fremantle, of course, and then Jerome Hunt, excuse me, Jerome Hunter, who there's a report that he might not play this year either. Right now he is not, he is 
not playing, he's not participating in basketball activities for an undetermined amount of time. That's kind of the extent of what we know about Jerome Hunter's situation right now. He's out indefinitely. With Hunter gone, potentially, with Fremantle gone for at least the first half of the year, with Nunji, of course, gone, that's a significant amount of front court depth to be out the door. Factor in Boom and Kunkel and Jones all being out the door in the backcourt, and you have what's going to be a pretty brand new looking team for Sean Miller and Xavier next season. Now, that is not necessarily mean that this team is going to take a deep dive or anything like that. In fact, I think the job that Miller did in terms of adding talent via the transfer portal is one of the more perhaps underrated or underappreciated transfer portal off seasons of the year. Miller added Abu Usmane from North Texas. Usmane is a six foot 11 center who averaged 11 and six at a very good North Texas team in Conference USA last year, team that went all the way to the uh, NIT championship game. In fact, they won the NIT last year. Very, very good team that had a handful of really talented players, including Tyler Perry, who is now at Kansas State. Usmane was kind of their big down low rim protector rebounder, low post score. He's going to come over to Xavier and presumably fill a similar role now with even more expectation on him if Fremantle uh, is unable to return later in the season. They also had Logan Duncombe. Duncombe was a former top 100 prospect in the state of Indiana. He went to Indiana the last two years, played almost ve- played 18 games in two years, nine games as a freshman, nine games as a sophomore. In those nine games as a sophomore, he played about six minutes per game, averaged about three points, two boards. So not a guy who got a lot of Playing time, not a guy who had a lot of opportunity. Of course, Indiana had a very loaded front court last year, so not a surprise to see him hit the portal, but a guy who has some pedigree, who I imagine Miller had a a hand in trying to recruit uh, when he was coming out of high school as well. So hopefully there's some camaraderie there, which could lead to him having some kind of breakout season or at least a more productive season for Xavier next season, especially again now with with, uh, Fremantle out for at least the first part of the season. They're going to rely on him potentially even more. And they also made some key additions in the backcourt as well. Again, no Sule Boom, no no Colby Jones, no Adam Kunkel, but they bring in Davion McKnight from Western Kentucky. McKnight averaged 16 and a half points, five boards, and four assists last year at Western Kentucky, shot about 34% from deep. They also add Quincy Oliveri. He's coming over from Rice, just under 19.6 boards last year, also a little over two assists per game, shot about 36.5% from three. Both those guys are kind of in that Sule boom kind of vibe of mid-major transfers who had the ball in their hands a bunch, who did a lot of scoring, not necessarily the most efficient scores, but high volume, high, you know, high possession scores. They both can't fill that role for Xavier. So it'll be interesting to see who ends up being the guy that runs that Sule boom type role for Sean Miller, has the ball a bunch, attacks the rim, kind of everything facilitates through them. It's going to be one of these two guys. I can almost guarantee you that. Whoever does it is going to be probably one of the more prolific scorers in the entire Big East next year. Whoever else does it, if they can adjust to a a different role, if they can adjust to maybe being more of a, a sharpshooter or maybe uh, even coming off the bench, depending on how Miller wants to run it, I think that this backcourt could be really, really solid. But that is going to be a bit of a question mark for them. Beyond that, Desmond Claude is a big breakout candidate for this team. Again, five leading scorers out the door, uh, six if you count Fremantle. So Claude is kind of that seventh guy, a guy who averaged four and a half points per game last year, 2.5 rebounds as a true freshman, top 100 guy. He has a potential to kind of step into that Colby Jones role as sort of a jackknife, do it all type guy. And I think could be one of the more surprising players in the Big East next season. The ultimate question here is, can this team compete in the Big East? It's going to be tough. It was always going to be tough. It was always going to be tough with this offseason, without Fremantle, without his expertise, without his experience, without his size, floor spacing abilities, all the things that he brings to that offense. I think that makes it even more challenging because right now you got UConn, you got Marquette, you got Creighton. That's a really tough top three. The best case for Xavier is probably fourth. But you also have to fight off a Providence team that brings in Kim English and kept a lot of talent and brought in some premier talent as well. you got to fight off St. John's team that's a completely different roster under Rick Pitino. you got to fight off a Villanova team that had a down year last year but brought in some premier talent in the transfer portal this offseason. Akeem Hart, TJ Bamba are among them. Kyle Neptune I think is going to have a step up in year two. So Xavier's in a tough spot. 
they have the talent, they have the coaching staff to, I think, be a top five, top six team in this conference. But this is going to be a really new look roster for Sean Miller. And if they don't have Fremantle for the entire season, they're going to be in a lot more trouble than they would have been otherwise. Well, folks, like I said, we're continuing our conference preview series today, talking about the Big West Conference, which used to be a revolving door for NCAA tournament bids. But lately, one team has really kind of risen above the rest. And boy, did that team have themselves a fantastic offseason. We're going to talk about it after a word from today's sponsor, Game Time. Life is always so busy, and the last thing that I want to be stressed out about is buying tickets to events. Thankfully, there's Game Time, which has killer deals on last-minute tickets for all of the events that I want to go to. Plus, when choosing seats for events, I don't like getting stressed out about whether I'm going to be able to see, whether the sun's going to be in my eyes, what does the view look like at these seats. However, Game Time has images of views from your seat, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time is the place for last-minute ticket deals. They have deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. In fact, if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app now, create an account, and use promo code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Folks, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen or your first watch of the day. We got more of these conference preview series coming your way later this week. We're also going to look at some new reports about uh, conference realignment continues to be in the news. We're going to talk about a report that there is going to be a new postseason competition going on in Las Vegas. We'll talk about that and more coming up later this week on Locked On College Basketball. For now, we are starting our Big West Conference preview as part of our conference preview series, previewing all 32 conferences in college basketball. Ten of them are getting their own full show. That's the Power Six, as well as the A-10, the AAC, the Mountain West, and the WCC. We've already talked about the ACC and the SEC. Check them out in your feed. But right now, we're going to talk about the Big West Conference, starting with the biggest storyline. The biggest storyline to me this offseason for the Big West Conference is the Gauchos of Santa Barbara. This is the team that won the conference last year, 15-5 and five record in Big West play, and they had themselves a heck of an offseason, folks. This team added two power five players, power six players, I should say, coming down. I hate that phrase, but I use it a lot on the show. I apologize. The transfer down uh, where a player from a power five or a high major program comes down to a low major program and typically, presumably, will perform better because they are uh, going to have the ball in their hands a lot more. Uh, we saw that with Santa Barbara added what I think is one of the more intriguing transfer additions of the entire portal season in Johan Traore. Traore comes from Auburn. He was a top 25 player in his recruiting class, did not really get off the ground at Auburn last year. And now he comes to to, uh, to Santa Barbara alongside Ben Schultzberg, who comes over from Creighton, and they almost landed a third. Zach Clements had committed to Santa Barbara out of Kansas. It looked like the Gauchos were going to land three power six players during this transfer cycle. Clements ultimately changed his mind, returned to Kansas, leaving Santa Barbara with still Traore and Schultzberg coming in, joining a team that, like I said, went 15 and five last year in the Big West, 27 and eight overall. They did not lose a single player to the NCAA transfer portal. They did lose some key players uh, in terms of graduation, but still a, a team that I expect to continue to be a really big part of Big West basketball next season. Other storylines in the conference, unfortunately, one of the storylines that we end up talking about pretty regularly when we're doing these mid-major uh, conference previews is the amount of talent leaving the conference. It always feels like you know, there, there are a handful of these transfer downs that we talk about, and a lot of them end up having a lot of success, and it's kind of a fun storyline to follow. But most of the time, the amount of talent coming into the conference from freshmen and transfers is going to be less than the amount of talent leaving the conference. Because for the most part, high-level players who produce at schools in conferences like the Big West, if they get poached, if they get you know opportunities to play at the Power Five level, they're going to take advantage. I can't say I blame them. 
I don't think that it's a bad thing necessarily. It's just a storyline that kind of always comes up with these conferences. You look at the Big West. Zion Poland was a premier player at Riverside last year. He's going all the way out to Florida, Gainesville, to join Todd Golden at that program over there. Latrell Wrightsell, for those of you who listened to our SEC preview, you heard me mention that I think Latrell Wrightsell is my pick for sixth man of the year in the WCC next season. He transfers from in the WCC, in the SEC next season. He transfers from Fullerton to Alabama, where he will play presumably behind Aaron Estrada and the rest of that returning guard group with Mark Sears there and Nate Oates. And then, of course, two players from UC Irvine hit the transfer portal as well. Dawson Baker, who goes over to BYU in their first year in the Big 12, and DJ Davis, a sneaky, fantastic addition for Butler and Tad Mata's team over there. I think he's going to be a premier player for the Bulldogs, uh, but two big losses for Irvine, who finished with the same record in conference play as uh, as Santa Barbara last year, but obviously may take a dip, t- take a dip with losing some of their premier talent. And then I, I mentioned this at the top too. Continuity has not been something we have seen out of the Big West. UC Santa Barbara has been in the big dance two of the last three years. That doesn't seem that surprising. But the eight years prior to that, not including the COVID year that did not have a tournament, there was eight different teams from the Big West. That is hard to do. Like that seems almost impossible. Like the odds of like a coin flip ending like that are insane. Eight years, eight different teams from the Big West uh, that wasn't eight different regular season winners. It was eight different conference tournament winners. We know with conferences like the Big West, regular season winner, unfortunately, just doesn't matter. Whoever wins that tournament, you win that tournament at the end of the season, bam, you're going to the big dance. That's it. Eight years, eight different teams did that. Now, Santa Barbara has kind of put themselves in a position to be a more regular part of the NCAA tournament. That's how it starts. If you're a 14 seed three years in a row, the next year, you might get a 13 seed. It doesn't usually take three years, and there's uh, there's obviously other factors. That's not a rule or anything like that. But you start continually making the big dance. You start putting yourself in a position where you're not winning 20 games every other year. You're winning 20 games every year. You're winning 25 games most year. You're pushing 30. Santa Barbara has put themselves in a position where they are a premier destination for transfers. They are getting mid high major transfers to play at their program. And they're putting themselves in a position where if next year they make the big dance, that's three out of four. Suddenly it starts to look like there's one team kind of rising above the rest. And I think that's the big thing to watch for those of you who are going to be paying attention to Big West basketball this year. Last thing, we've been talking coaching changes for all the different leagues. So I want to mention the one coaching change going down in the Big West this year. Northridge, Cal State Northridge replaces coach Trent Johnson with newcomer Andy Newman. For those of you who maybe don't pay a lot of attention to the Big West, you might recognize the name Trent Johnson. And that's because Trent Johnson has a long and decorated career as a college basketball head coach. He was a longtime head coach at Nevada to the point where he's in the University of Nevada's Hall of Fame. He was also a head coach briefly at Stanford, at LSU, and at TCU. He's a coach that made the NCAA tournament five times in his career. Now, Why would a coach who has that kind of pedigree be getting fired or let go, in this case he resigned, from a school like Cal State Northridge? Well, because the results weren't there. He last coached at TCU in the 2015-2016 season. He then took over a half decade off, got hired at Cal State Northridge in the 2021-22 season, spent two years with the Matadors, and went 14-48. and Not getting it done. We have seen coaches do this in the past where they retire or leave or get fired from a high major job, wait a half-ish decade, come back and coach at a lower level. You hope it works. Unfortunately, it doesn't often work. I think Steve Lavin is a really current example of that, a guy who coached at UCLA and St. John's, uh, spent about a half decade away from coaching and is now starting at San Diego. Not a great year last year. you got to give him more time than that. Maybe he'll turn those Toreros around. But there's a lot of history of this not necessarily working out. So Johnson resigns after two years of only winning 14 games at Cal State Northridge. They hire Andy Newman. Andy Newman is not a name that people will recognize, but he went 91-30 in five seasons at D2 Cal State San Bernardino. Worth pointing out that coaching at the Cal State system probably gives him an advantage in terms of understanding the university, understanding how the school works, budgeting, all that stuff. He's going to 
bump up from going to D2 to D1. So hopefully that helps him. He also spent a decade as an assistant at Cal State Fullerton and was briefly their interim head coach in the 2012-2013 season. So a guy who's very familiar with the Big West and the Cal State systems getting hired at Northridge, a program that hasn't been particularly good for a while, but perhaps uh, with some fresh eyes on that program, we'll have a chance to, to potentially make some noise. Well, folks, we're going to close up the show discussing if anyone can compete with that Santa Barbara team in the Big West. We'll take a stab at a dark horse candidate who could win that conference, as well as some award predictions. All of that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 back in bonus bets, guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use. You can bet on everything from spreads to the money line to anything. Anything you want to bet on, you can do it. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you will not want to miss. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. Folks, closing out the show today, talking about our favorites to win the Big West Conference, some dark horse teams that are in that mix as well, and doing our award predictions as part of our season preview series for every single conference in college basketball. One of my favorite things that we get to do on this show. I love talking about the, the big programs, of course, but it's also fun to talk about some of the little guys as well. Not a secret here, the favorite to win the Big West, in my opinion, is Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is the clear favorite, quite frankly. They went 15-5 and five last year, dominated this conference in a significant way, and they reloaded. We talked about adding uh, adding Johan Traore from Auburn, a guy who was a top 25, top 30 prospect in his class. Didn't play much at Auburn, just didn't get off the floor, didn't see a lot of playing time, and, and there's some risk here. He's not guaranteed to be successful because he was a top 25 prospect. That is not a guarantee, but this is a program that has had success with this kind of player. They have done this before. And again, it's not just Treyora. They also had Ben Schultzberg. Schultzberg played six minutes per game last year at Creighton, about one and a half points per game. Again, not a guy who, who got a lot of playing time for a Blue Jays program that was really, really stacked with players. But he comes in now. He gets a, perhaps a bigger opportunity to step onto the floor. Beyond that, Santa Barbara didn't lose anybody in the transfer portal. They did lose two of their key players to graduation. That'd be Miles Norris, who began his career at Oregon, transferred down to a community college, and then spent the last three years at Santa Barbara, six foot ten, big guy, averaged 14.1 points per game last year. They also lose Andre Kelly. Andre Kelly spent four years at Cal before transferring to Santa Barbara, averaged 9.3 points per game for the Gauchos last year. So they do lose some key players, but they also return AJ Mitchell. AJ Mitchell was AJ Mitchell, excuse me, was their point guard last year, 16.3 points and five assists. He comes back with a real opportunity to be an all Big West first team caliber player, potentially even in that conversation for player of the year. So you get your star point guard back. You bring in two players with some high major pedigree coming into your program, a guy who was a high ranking recruit. You get the rest of your depth back. You don't lose a whole lot of other key talent. To me, this is a program that has a real chance of not only winning the Big West, which they've done in the past, but being a, a, one of the better mid-major programs, I was going to say on the West Coast, but maybe just in college basketball. I, I don't know if they're going to compete for 30 wins the way that teams like Charleston and, and FAU have done in the past necessarily, but they won 27 games last year. Not crazy to think that if Traore kind of taps into some of that potential, if Schultzberg taps into some of that potential, if A.J. Mitchell has another productive season, this could be a really nice year for Joe Pasternak and the Gauchos. Beyond that, the two teams that finished right below them in the standings were Irvine and Riverside. They lost some really key players. We talked about them already. Zion Poland going from Riverside to Florida. That's a tough loss. Irvine losing both Dawson Baker and DJ Davis. They brought in some new players. It's not like they're, you know, they're, they did try to do what they can to replace them, but not at the level that I think Santa Barbara did. And to me, they're a pretty clear favorite to win this thing next season. But there are some dark horses. And while I don't really consider Irvine and Riverside dark horses, there is one team, the only team in college basketball that has their own dang time zone that I think could do this. And that is the University of Hawaii. Hawaii finished fifth last year in the Big West. So it's not like they were a, a you know, this isn't a worst to first situation necessarily. They finished fifth. They went 13 and seven. They were a good Big West opponent last year or Big West team. They were a solid team in that conference. 
22 and 11 on the year. They finished 130th in Ken Palm. That's pretty darn good for a mid-level Big West program, 130th in Ken Palm. Well, that was pretty good. Now, they lost two double-digit scores from their roster, Kamaka Hepa and Samatua Avea. Both those guys graduated and moved on with their careers, so they are not coming back to the program. But they added a couple transfers that are intriguing to me. First up is Yale transfer Matu Cotton. Cotton did not play last season, but during the 2021-22 season, he averaged 7.1 points and 3.6 boards for Yale. And again, Yale is an Ivy League school, of course, but they're a good Ivy League program, one of the best a quality mid-major basketball program, a player who can average seven points per game for Yale coming down to the Big West, coming over to the Big West. I think there's a chance for him to really blossom into a key piece for this Hawaii squad. The last player they're adding is grad transfer Justin McCoy. Justin McCoy has four years of experience in the ACC. That sounds fantastic and sounds like the kind of player that any Big West school would love to have. It is worth pointing out that Justin McCoy played very, very little in his four years in the ACC. He's a six foot eight forward. He spent his first two years of college at the University of Virginia, transferred and spent the next two years at North Carolina. Again, got the Tar Heels attention, ended up at North Carolina on Chapel Hill. Now he played 6.6 minutes in 41 games at North Carolina, averaged barely over a point per game. And he wasn't much better at Virginia, 33 games in two years there. He did play about 10 minutes per game at Virginia in those 33 games, average about two and a half points. But fifth year, going out with a bang, getting an opportunity to play some more minutes, six foot eight forward, going all the way to Hawaii, about as far away from the ACC as you can possibly be. I don't know. This is something to, to pay attention to here. It's really hard to predict which of these transfers who, who, who transfer from high major programs to, to lower major programs. Some of these guys pop, some of them don't. And it's, it's always hard to kind of project unless we're, you know, watching practices, super plugged into the programs. It's not always easy for us to know. But there's, there's a reason that this Hawaii team with these two players, with Cotton and McCoy coming in, could make some real noise in the Big West next season. Closing out the show with our award predictions. We'll talk player of the year, transfer slash newcomer of the year, coach of the year, and defensive player of the year. Starting with player of the year, a guy I have not mentioned yet, despite being one of the most prolific mid-major scorers in all of college basketball. That's Elijah Pepper. Fantastic name, fantastic player. He's at UC Davis, 22 and a half points per game last year. He did not win player of the year last year, despite scoring 22 and a half points per game. He also averaged six boards, three and a half assists, 1.6 steals. A tremendous mid-major scorer. To me, I don't think Davis is going to be all that good. He is going to be the player of the year because if he can put up 20-ish points per game again, it's going to be really hard to ignore him for the voters. Also, fantastic that he stayed at UC Davis. Again, never, never discredit a player for leaving a program when they're capable of going somewhere else. But it's also kind of fun when they stick around. And I think this is cool that Pepper's going to be back at UC Davis next season. Transfer newcomer of the year, I'm going with Traore. Not a big shock here. I think Cotton at Hawaii could compete for that award. I think there's a handful of other guys who could compete for that award as well. But the upside with Traore is just so good. He's so talented. And things did not work out at Auburn. And maybe they won't work out here. But also maybe they will. Maybe he becomes a, a, a guy who can average a double-double or get close to it. 15 and 9, something like that seems entirely plausible for Traore uh, and uh, Joe Pasternak at Santa Barbara. Speaking of Joe Pasternak, that's my coach of the year right there, Santa Barbara, the Gauchos. I think, again, 15 and 5, they're going to improve on that. I think this is a, a thirty a capable 30-win team next year. And if they do that, even though... Pasternak's not going to necessarily improve much from last year's roster uh, or last year's record. I think that's enough for him to take home coach of the year if this team runs away with the Big West title, which I think is very, very possible based on their roster construction right now. Closing out the show, defensive player of the year, Jaden Jones at Long Beach State. Shout out Dan Monson, the head coach at Long Beach State. He was the coach of that Gonzaga team in 1999 that went on that Elite Eight run. Next year, some guy named Mark Few took over the program, and here we are. Jaden Jones over at Long Beach State. He led the conference in defensive box plus minus last year. He averaged 1.7 steals per game. He's back in the mix. I think there's a real chance that he ends up being this conference's best defensive player when all is said and done. 
Now, folks, that's going to wrap us up for today here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. I want to thank all of you for making the show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Love doing the conference preview series. Really happy to get an opportunity to talk about some of these teams and programs and more in depth as we get closer and closer to the start of the 23-24 college basketball season. Go hit that subscribe button. Go leave us a like on YouTube to let us know you were here. Drop a comment. Let us know what you think about these conference previews. It is all very much appreciated. Once again, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as always, peace out.